Welcome to the Bicurian Podcast, where we explore and embrace the seeming contradictions of life. What actually is Bicurian, you ask? Well, you may not necessarily have a mental concept of Bicurian, personally, maybe because it's a made up word. You embody it. What's happening right now in terms of the divisions between us is a focus on that which is different. And lack of understanding and empathy for people's beliefs is no longer an excuse. And it is in the differences we carry in ourselves that we find the Bicurian moment. When you really dig into something, you're going to see some depth to it. It's not just a race thing. It's not just a conservation thing. It's letting go of the or to make room for the and. We embrace all of you. Welcome to the Bicurian. Hi, I'm Aisla. And I'm Eric. And we are very excited about our guest today, uh, Tyler Bet- Betillion. We said it wrong and I wanted to say it right. <laughs> Batillion. Batillion. Tyler Batillion. He was a writer and uh, we came across him on Medium. On Medium. Yeah. Where we've really... been finding a lot of very interesting articles lately. I highly recommend um, checking out you know all of the people that are on there it's very kind of raw and 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 there's some you know strange things on there but there's a lot of good material for sure and we found some so yeah and it was just really struck by uh the content and we're very excited that uh tyler uh was interested in being on our podcast to talk about some of those things so welcome yeah thank you for having me on so tell us about yourself because we're just getting to know you for the first time since it's the first time we've chatted Yeah, so I am a writer. I am a former software engineer. I'm living in Berkeley, California, but I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah. I kind of came out here to pursue every young software engineer's dream of making it big in the entrepreneur land of Silicon Valley. Um, and I, I quickly became kind of disenchanted with some of the, the ways I saw technology deployed out here. And so a lot of my writing career has kind of come out of that fledgling writing career, I should say. Um, but it's come out of that kind of looking around at Silicon Valley and seeing that, you know, the promise of technology might have been to raise everyone up. Um, but that's not really the goal of a lot of people out here pursuing the the entrepreneurial dream. Well, and our listeners know that I, I don't usually have much good to say about Facebook in the ways that it's been used to manipulate things. But um, I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts on on such things because I, I, I too work for a tech company. We're actually based in Palo Alto. Uh, we have an office out here in Colorado. So I get the benefits of the Silicon Valley life without actually having to be in the Bay Area. That said, we make a website development platform. Like we're not, you know, revolu- we're not disruptive technology one of my favorite Silicon Valley terms. We yeah. are we are problem solving in a world where people need websites. So we built a platform for doing that. But uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you can, you know, this is kind of the bonus content because we'll post the article that we found from you as well as any others that you would recommend. But um, tell us what some of the writings that you're doing along those lines. Sure. So one piece I'm working on right now, I'm going to talk to someone from the EFF on Monday about is uh Interesting idea I read about in the MIT Technology Review, a data bill of rights. You know, speaking about Facebook, obviously, we've got huge issues with data privacy and, and what it is to be a steward or data. You know, Facebook clearly not a good steward, but some other companies, maybe slightly better stewards, like Apple does a pretty good job. But, you know, in this article, I want to explore some of the challenges of of building something like that, because it sounds like a really wonderful idea right on the surface of it, but very quickly you start getting into some some challenging aspects, like what data qualifies as personal data that should be protected and have absolute protections? Well, uh, Europe already answered that question for us because GDPR was a big part of my daily life when sure. that hit because uh, the internet is who that was really targeting and, and the ways in which your information is being bought and sold by just the sites you visit. So uh, Europe is starting to make that. And I've heard tale that California is going to be yeah. the next in line to pass GDPR style um, oh, well, legislation. Our last guest actually is a privacy attorney who practices in the tech industry in California. And she said that she's involved with the movement around the data privacy bill of rights so it's interesting because the first time i heard about it was when she mentioned it in our last recording and now so it sounds like it's getting some real legs 
So do you feel yeah. like the companies out there want to be responsible with the information or is this kind of lip service from some of them? Uh, most, most do not, right? Most do not want some regulatory statute telling them what they have to do with people's data and what data they have to give you access to and those sorts of things. There are some that I think do a pretty good job, like Apple, for example, is a company that cares deeply about privacy and also critically doesn't monetize the selling of your data. So they're not mm -hmm. an advertisement company. They're a hardware company. Right. Ultimately, they are. They're selling hardware and they're selling access, but not necessarily um, the information. Yeah, I mean um, – yeah, I, I think about the iCloud, and I'm, I'm a fully connected Apple person. I've got a whole ton of, you know, Apple computers and iPhone and all of that. And I love the connection that I have with everything. My files are always in the same spot. My keychain is global across all my devices. And I do. I trust them fundamentally not to mess with me around that. So yeah, right. And, and importantly, not to do something like what Facebook did, which is, sell your data to a third party without indicating to you that they've done so. And then, you know, basically profit off of gossiping about you in a digital way and in a huge, massive scale. Right. Well, and I think that's what people missed about Facebook at the time. We are not Facebook's customer. They're giving us this free service. And what we're paying for that free service is all of our information that they that's then use they to target advertising or whatever. That's right. You thought that Facebook, the website, was the product, but you are the product. You are the product. The advertisers are the clients, and the website just happens to exist yeah. as an excellent way to collect you, the digital version of you that they then sell to advertisers. Yeah. Yeah, that was a thing. Um, you know, and, and it actually struck me, it was a few years ago, um, and maybe you remember this, when... Uh, Google had something going on around um, Despicable Me. And so they had Minions. Maybe it was even the Minions movie. It was a few years ago. But they they added on to a lot of people's outgoing emails this Minion doing a mic drop. And that meant that some people were sending, like, condolences for, you know, a recent death to somebody. And at the bottom is a Minion doing a mic drop. Mm. And people were pissed that Gmail would dare do that. This is a free product. Like they could just turn it off on you tomorrow. You're not even paying. There's no guarantee about it, but we live in a world where we get these free products. Not only do we have expectations about how they're going to work, but we have expectations about the service that they're going to provide with this free product. And yet we don't think that there's a double side to that of how they track our information or monetize us in some way. Google is not one of the largest companies in the world because they give Gmail away for free. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think that in the future, we'll look back on this period of time and especially, you know, maybe the previous 10 years and we'll go, oh, wow, we, we were pretty naive about what really made the internet go round and what was paying for all these products. But we're waking up. We are seeing a lot of pushback against Facebook. Even, you know, internally, Google employees are starting to be like, oh, you know, maybe no, let's not support Project Dragonfly and Chinese censorship. And maybe we should walk out over issues of sexual harassment in the workplace. So we're starting to see the beginnings of, and, you know, I hope, the yeah. beginnings of a bit of a labor movement in tech. Yeah, I, I think I think it's time. And I I do have hope. There's definitely steps forward. So hopefully that will continue. And we'll keep working on making it continue. Um, I do want to ask you about some of the stuff that was in your piece, like some of the things that you said that I thought were one of one of the things that caught me right at the beginning was the Pew Research statistic or um, citing that said that in in America, uh, black people and white people have more in common than Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, this was a really interesting study. So the report covers, it's a Pew Research Center report, covers questions that they've been asking since 1994. And, you know, they get all kinds of demographic information along with all the responses to the questions. And they show, you know, two very interesting things. The first is that the, the median Democrat and the median Republican have been 
moving extremely in opposite directions. So it used to be the case that if you represented as a Democrat, you still probably shared in common, you know, among these 12 or 15 or whatever, however many questions it was that the Pew Research Center survey covered, you typically shared at least one or two or maybe even five or six, depending on how close you are to the political center or not, opinions with people who identified as Republicans. And now the median and Democrat and the median Republican share essentially nothing in common. They're very divided strictly along party lines. Yeah. And then they also showed that at the same time that this was happening, that Democrats and Republicans are moving much further away from each other in terms of their political alignment. The, the effect was still there, but not nearly as pronounced among people of different demographics. So, you know, black people, Latino people, white people still share more. They still look, if you look at the little charts, the graphs, they still share many more features in common about, you know, their political leanings and their political ideals than a random Republican and a random Democrat. Wow. I, I can't say I'm truly surprised by that. It, it does no, definitely feel that way. Yeah, I, it flies in the face of some of the kind of rhetoric that has become very popular, but I don't think that it's a crazy idea to think like, oh, wow, people of different races are not monolithic groups. You know, they have a wide array of different political opinions and beliefs inside of them, just like gender identity groups, just like sexuality identity groups. You know, we're all not monolithic, singular beings. And being white tells you less than you might think about one's political ideology, the same way that being Latino or being black tells you less than you might at first want to think about someone's political ideology. Yeah, I mean, even even the broad strokes that I've heard people bring up, um, there's a lot of fallacies in there. Like, people don't really understand that um, – the majority of Latinos that are naturalized citizens in this country actually are very conservative and tend to go Republican more often than not. So, you know, here you have this thing like you think um, – I, I run into people that think that, you know, they're one of those groups of brown people who are disenfranchised and, and think progressively, and it's not even the case. And there's been a lot of interesting stuff like that throughout history. One of the, you know, most interesting periods of time for this, I think – was shortly after 2011 and the September 11th attacks, right? At this moment in time, 2001, let's say, Muslims and Christians looked like very, very natural political allies, both with conservative leanings, both with family values, you know, very much looking like Republican voters. And then immediately after 9-11, we're very hawkish on Muslims. You know, we all across the world, because more xenophobic regarding Muslims after that moment, but especially hawks on the right say things that started to sound very racist to a lot of Muslim people, right? Mm -hmm. And they go, well, now I can't have my political alignment there, even though on many other issues, I might feel very similarly. You know, think about the social issues overlap between Muslim ideology, Muslim, you know, um, theology, and Christian theology, they're quite similar. But suddenly, that's not a political alliance, but a stark political division. Yeah, well, and one of the things that you talked about was the relationship between Martin Luther King and, and Johnson and, and, the, and how that got changed even in the movie Selma. And it really made me notice, in terms of just our current political landscape, the politicians that are willing to genuinely work across the aisle definitely get called names around being sellouts. Like I really respected Senator Jeff Flake. I don't know that I agree with him politically. And I do feel like consistently he stood up and made some attempts to honor his integrity around what he thought he was representing in terms of his people and his party. And then also stand against some things or for some things that he thought were important that were maybe not traditional for for his particular senatorial position. And and really, nobody gave him any kind of break for that. He just got called all kinds of sellout on every level. <laughs> it was just like, wow. And, you know, I don't know him. And, and I'm sure there's it's more complicated than that. And there's just there's a lot of um, 
if there's almost it's almost like a violence there's a lot of political violence if people even seem to be comfortable with the idea of representing beyond their party yeah i agree i think we we are seeing especially in the political class a huge amount of polarization unwillingness to compromise disinterest in working together you know we're in the we're currently in the middle of a government shutdown over you know what is not ultimately a ton of government money i mean 5 billion dollars is a lot of money but at the scale of united states gdp it's not a ton and there's literally no movement right we are getting nowhere there's no idea about what a compromise will look like and it's mostly political game playing right because yeah. that affects people's lives yes yeah oh of course but it's, it, I mean, all, it's it like, always affects right. people's but i'm saying like it's this big game like it's this big game up there and then there's people who are like i can't pay my health care bill that's right. I, I my, yeah, my, I my right mortgage is starting to be in jeopardy now. because so many people live paycheck to paycheck. And it, it's that, you know, like the consequences are now. This isn't. And yet still. I don't Nothing know. Nothing happens. No, yeah. No. It's weird. It, this is very frustrating. And it's weird because I know I like it's funny because Eric is uh, over the last year that we've been working together. I've been involved in, you know, politics in terms of like community organizing and working on different campaigns for a really long time. And I actually have worked with a lot of politicians that I really respect. And I know that a majority of people get involved in politics because they care. They want to, they want to make a difference and they, and, and it's not, I mean, yes, there are some perks to it and it's kind of a thankless job, like, you know, and, and yet at the same time, I can see that, you know, the, the situation that we're in right now, something has to shift. I mean, I'm excited about people like Alexandria Ocasio who are coming in from a different perspective, but, um, you know, she doesn't have political clout in Congress. She has personal clout outside. Like she's got a couple million people who think she's doing a great job, but she's not going to make it in Congress if she doesn't actually have the ability to also build a coalition there. Like that's that's a, right, and that's you see, thing. you know, you see the wheels turning against her. The, oh, yeah. the hate machine is turned on full force, and that's going to continue for her. Absolutely. So, what would you say, like that, like that King Johnson partnership? What do you think is necessary for that to happen? Do you see that being possible in our modern situation? I mean, in the immediate short term, no. We're very entrenched in our ways. It, you can always look forward to some big changes and some big. You know, the next big election is going to be definitely a big one. And if we change the players, we can change the game. But the current players that we have right now, I don't think are are interested in one and come here to now what the real grievances of the people are and trying to address them. I think they have shown that they're pretty much interested in playing political political power games. Mm -hmm. And, you know... This is the least productive, one of the least productive Congresses we've had in history. No legislation gets passed. And when it does get passed, you know for sure that Trump at the top is going to say, oh, Democratic Congress passed something? I'm going to veto that. Woo! Yeah, well, and I mean, I, I hate to say it, but there's a little part of me that actually likes that about the current situation is I'd rather have stalemate for two years and maybe the country will start leaning back towards – fixing some of these issues and and actually looking at it. It's funny because I saw a um a, a news piece and one of the big things that Trump campaigned on, like he's all about the wall right now, but one of the big things he campaigned on was draining the swamp. Yeah. And he literally in 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 an interview after he was elected said, Yeah, that just sounded good. I just said that. And it's like, man, that was the kind of the one thing I could kind of get behind you on was this idea of cleaning up um, having less politics and more coalition stuff. I didn't expect him to do it, but I, I, you know, it's funny because that's not the thing that he's, of course, <laughs> all hung up on about his, you know, campaign message of how important something was. But uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe Congress with a whole new batch of fresh, younger blood um, is the beginning. Be nice. I don't know for sure. I do think it helps, you know, whenever there is some kind of long-term stalemate, changing out the players makes a big difference. 
But I do think like there, there were some big opportunities. You know, Trump also campaigned on the idea of infrastructure and fixing our crumbling roads and updating our bridges. And Ocasio-Cortez, diametrically opposed to Trump in so many ways, campaigned on a new green deal, which is functional. Mm-hmm. And there's humans there. Hey, let's fix our roads. And in places where it makes sense, let's lay down some solar panels next to it. And in places that make sense, let's build some wind turbines and let's clean up the electrical infrastructure. That's a big deal to me as a Californian. You know, PG&E is probably, that's our utility. They are probably going to be found guilty of causing campfire. And they are going to be on the hook for a massive lawsuit, right? So we have serious infrastructural problems that cut across party lines. You know, the roads are not Republican or Democrat. And the fact that people are dying because of bad roads and bad infrastructure is not a partisan issue. We have people on both sides campaigning for essentially the same ideas. But what did Trump lead with instead of infrastructure to start out his, you know, big bang, I'm in office? It was, you know, Muslim travel ban. Yep. So instead and, and now of- the wall. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. yeah. And like, so yeah, like I said, there's a little part of me that likes the idea of two years of stalemate, but. Well, I mean, if he, if he put something forward that was infrastructure, then there wouldn't be. I mean, I, I do think that the part there's there, maybe, maybe, maybe it would be, but I, th- I think that people would actually get on board with doing something that was genuinely good for the country. Nobody, like you said, nobody can argue with roads. I, yeah, I hope could no one can argue with roads. We can ham and haw about like where exactly that money should go. You know, how much should be going to West Oakland and how much should be going to rural panhandle Florida places, right? Yeah. And we can figure that out. But that's a negotiation that I think people are willing to have. Yeah. So we've been talking about this article and it is about... um it is about the, uh, you know, aspects of uh, polarization and that sort of thing. Maybe you can give us a little wrap up on what your kind of conclusions were regarding that. Sure. So my main point for Medium was that we are currently in a situation where most of the time individuals are responding to their worst fears about the people that they see as not like them. So here in Berkeley, I get a ton of people who, as soon as the conversation turns to politics, they're like, oh, and Trump voters, I can't believe how many racists there are in America. It's just like everybody who voted for Trump, many people here uh, ascribe Trump's exact level of vitriol or you know, Milo Yiannopoulos' exact level of vitriol to all of the people who voted for Trump. And while you know, there may be some truth to the idea that if you were willing to vote for Trump, you're willing to kind of dismiss some of his more racist ideas. But at the same time, that is not what I think the majority of Republican voters who voted for Trump were voting because of. That wasn't the conscious choice thing. And then I'm the other of the aisle. You have people like, you know, Richard Spencer saying things like, hey, we're Republicans and we call for an ethno state. We want America to just be for white people. And so people in Berkeley are responding to that, you know, rhetoric and going, wow, that's Republicanism. That's pretty shocking and terrible, which it is. And then we have people who are Republicans responding to people like my friends in Berkeley that say, "Uh, hey, the only thing I know about you is that you voted for Trump and therefore you're racist. Let's not have a conversation. Bye bye. And this is the level of conversation that we're having. It's not a very productive one. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not really a conversation. And I feel like one of the things that you said that I really appreciated was that in the, initially some of these identity um, isms and politics and sort of awarenesses were more of a spotlight. Like, hey, let's let's notice that to be a woman or to be transgender or queer or a person of color or an immigrant brings you into these different ways of being that have a set of challenges that people who don't share those identities don't experience. It's a spotlight. Let's acknowledge that. And it's been turned into, and I really like that phrasing, a sword to say, oh, because you don't have those identities, you kind of need to shut up and we don't care what you think. 
And that's that doesn't help us at all. But I really appreciated that distinction in terms of recognizing that there's a purpose that they serve and and the, the spotlight's maybe a good one and the weapon is maybe not. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it comes down to the kinds of conversations that we want to have with people. So, like, let's say you're talking about the police. This is obviously a great issue where there's a huge difference in experience between white people and people of color, right? People of color are more likely to be arrested for the same crimes, once be convicted for the same crimes. Once they've been convicted, they're more likely to serve longer sentences for the same crimes. Once they have been sentenced, they're more likely to serve the entirety of their sentence rather than some portion and get off for good behavior for the same crimes. So knowing all of that, it is super important for people to recognize like, I am not going to have the same experience in the legal system as someone who is exactly like me, grew up in exactly my same, you know, class background, but has black skin. You know, they will have a different and almost certainly worse experience in, in our justice system than I do. And that's very important to know. And it's a, a huge part of our ongoing political struggle. This has been part of the United States from the very beginning. And then at the same time, if the conversation that you have with someone, when you're trying to point out those facts, if you start that conversation by saying, what happens to that person is that they're going to be defensive and they are going to dig in their heels on whatever it is you thought they were being racist about, regardless of how correct you are in identifying that perhaps racist tendency or racist thought, by not inviting empathy, by not choosing to try and help them see your perspective, but accuse them of being bad people, you make it very difficult to change those attitudes. I think you just gave one of the best explanations without actually using the terminology, because it is an abrasive terminology uh, to say white privilege. But that's right there. What people don't understand, that's what white privilege is. It's just the acknowledgement that you will have a different experience than someone else based on the color of your skin. And it doesn't yes. have to be a oh. negative thing, and it's not accusatory. It's just a, a awareness. Uh, we went to a, a white privilege symposium a few months ago, and it was fantastic because it really opened my eyes that that not it's not always an attack, and it's not always a you know some sort of like guilt mongering type tactic that people are using, but just this basic understanding that what you can do is be aware of it and not necessarily let it happen while you're there. That's right. And, you know, to me, our goal, recognizing that I've lived a very privileged life and I had a lot of luxuries, our goal should be to make sure that everybody can have that same kind of life, that we should raise everyone up to this standard. You know, we don't necessarily have to cause white people to have a worse experience in the justice system. No, we the don't want that. No, we don't. No one wants people. that. We need to make it fair for everyone else. Yeah. So, someone I was listening to is a black woman who works with in with the youth in the justice system, and she said, "I don't know why people think that we want white people to have more problems. It's never the goal. We we want right. people of color right. to be treated more fairly. We it's it's not about laws. We're not trying to take anything from anyone." But for some reason, that is how it gets it gets received. Yeah, and I think, you know, some of that is the type of fear that we've been talking about, the response to the worst versions of these arguments. Mm. So, you know, although it's a smaller movement, there are equivalents to like the Richard Spencer alt-right on the other side of the equation. You know, Nation of Islam comes to mind. So it's like there are prejudicial organizations, but we shouldn't be couching our thoughts as though like those are normal. You know, Richard Spencer is not a normal, whatever that means, or average Republican or white person. You know, he's very extreme. And the Nation of Islam is quite extreme in its opinions about race on the other side. Well, and that brings up something. It's it's one of my favorite um, quotes, and I, I try to um, 
say it often when it's relevant, and that is do not become the thing that you're fighting. Do not become a monster while you're fighting monsters or uh, figure that you have to be just as fervent and hateful in order to counteract fervent hatred. Um, it's not better. And, and from a left or right perspective, n- nobody is going to win in that long term. Yeah. Um, sure. Go ahead. I was going to say one other thing that we had talked about that you shared um, in your article was sort of one of the things that you experienced in terms of the Me Too movement and the the ways in which you hesitated to be open about your experiences in some ways because you have privilege. And I thought that was really powerful um, and it was kind of a vulnerable thing, um, but I was really hoping that you would share a little bit about that because I think it could be a good, um, a good thing for other people not to feel so alone, specifically, you know, white men who I think do feel kind of alone and isolated in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, sure. So for, for listeners who haven't read my piece yet, what Aisa was referring to is that I'm the victim of sexual assault. So both of my assaults happened when I was in college, both, I think, pretty typical. Um, well, I guess I don't know what's typical, but both happened in situations that you can imagine and that lots of other people have experienced too. Parties, drinking with people that I know, both of my attackers, people that I had known for a while before, before it happened. Um, and when, when Me Too started happening, you know, I wanted to, to talk about my experiences a little bit more, but I felt really cautious just knowing some of the, the political like guys, right? This, happening on Facebook and we've already talked a little bit about how those are not necessarily places where you go to have candid discussions about challenging topics and you know make you feel safe good places to be vulnerable and I think that's part, one of the things that was so powerful about the Me Too movement is people were able to say like hey you know in a place that we know isn't necessarily a safe place to have this kind of political discourse this happened to me and tons of people many 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 so many women at least in my feed, you know, oh, like, yeah. God, almost all of them, right? Saying, hey, this, this is what my experience was. And I, you know, I kind of wanted to say something too, but I saw one other person in my feed, one other man who did, you know, use the hashtag and was immediately just like castigated, 5,000 comments, you know, whoa, this isn't your moment. This isn't your time. You couldn't possibly understand what it's like to be a woman, although, you know, Maybe it's true for sexual assault. And that's kind of the, you know, ironically, that's kind of the tone of the messages. Maybe it's true that you experienced that. Um, and I, I thought that was a big missed opportunity for, you know, both for men to be like, hey, the, the patriarchy impacts us negatively too. And we should be able to talk about that as people who are very empowered to change the patriarchy, you mm-hmm. know, we should, I, I would like to feel more empowered to talk about those kinds of issues. And then also, too, a, a place to find more solidarity between men and women and say, like, hey, yeah, wow, that experience that we both shared sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. We don't want that to happen to anybody else. Yeah. I, I feel like it's I, another friend of mine, um, he did share an experience of uh, assault, and we'd actually talked about having him on the show to, to actually talk about it. And, um, and what was was interesting to me in his experience of sharing was that he had a lot of people message him privately, not publicly, right? Like, but privately and say, thank you. Like, I don't, I don't feel so alone. Like for men, there's like a, there's a lot in that. I know that when I was studying um, rave statistics, I said like, um, there were, there were robbers who would rape men as part of the robbery because they knew it would be less likely to be reported if they did that. Like, (laughs) so there's this culture where men are, they're not just not supposed to talk about it. It's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to be a victim. You're not a man. If you're a victim in that, you know, obviously it's not true, but that's the messaging that men receive. And so there's a lot of things. And so that's why I'm sad to hear that your friend was brave enough to share it 
and then received so much negative because all that does is perpetuate the actual problem we're living in. Like it, 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 it perpetuates the, the part of male toxicity that makes me too happen that females support, if you will, like, or female toxicity supports. I mean, put it that way. So, um, so it's a really complex, it's a topic I'd actually, I do really want to do a show on, on the complexity of that. And, uh, maybe we can have you and our other friend on, uh, and, and have like a larger yeah. conversation around it. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Well, actually, I mean, we're going to highly, a- oh, go ahead. I just can say it's, it's super tragic and it definitely, you know, the same way that women are not encouraged to come forward because they won't be believed. Men are not encouraged to come forward, not because they won't be believed, but because they will no longer be perceived as men, you know, or they'll become a lesser class of men. And it's very, you know, it's currently very embarrassing yeah. and very stigmatizing. Those facts, I think they both stem from the same root cause. And, you know, being more open and honest and being able to, you know, share definitely would help. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Well, we're definitely going to recommend people check out your article. So we'll post a link to that. If there's any other links you want us to share, go ahead and send them over. Um, we've covered a bunch of other articles and stuff, and I think people would love to find them. So we, we do share and share like on all of that. So um, it was great to chat with you today. We'd love to have you back at some point. Yeah, it was really great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Welcome to the Bikerian Moment. So, you first. Okay. Um, I was pretty excited about this one. The... uh, so let's see. Amanda Stenberg created a movie called When Hands Touch. And it is about a biracial teenager living in Nazi Germany who falls in love with a Nazi. And there's been a lot of fervor over it. The uh, the person who made it, Asante, sorry, Amanda Sendler was in it. Asante is the person that made it. And the the person that made it was ostensibly wanting to create a film that kind of talked about the difficulties of identity being biracial and living in this really a a time of upheaval. And um, there's been a lot of fervor. I haven't obviously seen it, so I don't really know where, where it lands that that says that he was actually romanticizing something about the Nazis, which is of course verboten. So uh, it just, for me, it was kind of an interesting a uh, bicurian moment in that like there's this question of we know that love love doesn't decide for us you know we we fall in love with who we fall in love with and the story was about sort of that like someone falling in love with someone who is by design and politics being trained to hate them and yet you know what does that lead to and what kinds of questions and you know you, you mentioned Amy and Jaguar before we started it's a movie that was actually the true story of these two women who fell in love and one of them was Jewish and the other one was the wife of a Nazi officer in, in Berlin under Nazi rule. And similarly, the question of like, what is that love relationship and the danger of it? So was that one universally panned? It was not, it did not have the same. So I don't know if perhaps there was something in this that, uh, that was, yeah, it looks like something we might have to actually watch before we can pass full judgment on it because it does seem like I, I watch out for certain movies like this and just entertainment in general. If it's trying to beat us over the head with something, um, I tend to see a lot of negative reactions. People can't put their finger on it or maybe there's just something flagrantly bad. But yeah, I mean, we're in a world right now where people want to romanticize um the world we live in and so stories that challenge us or seem like they're challenging don't seem to be as popular, right? And the, the stories that make us think, yeah, you know, people aren't really in the mood to dive into that stuff. So I'm curious to see it and maybe see what it's about. Well, and it was difficult to pan Amy and Jaguar because it was actually based on a true story. Like you can't, 
you can't say someone's romanticizing something right. when what they're doing is telling the story of these women who fell in love. Yeah. And and the Jewish woman paid for it with her life. I mean, she was killed. So that, you know, the, there was a horrible, tragic ending. Um, and And what Stenberg, the main character, said about the director is that they are very fascinated by this intersection of identity and how it is changed by our environments, our governments, our peers, and our families. And I actually also am really intrigued by that, the ways in which we will, you know, we can even see it today with something we were talking about in some ways with Tyler, that people are responding to a belief about a group by becoming more rigidly attached to their ideas. And being against that group. And being against that group. Like there's a defensiveness in this this idea of our identity and the ways in which it is created by how we perceive the world around us. Yeah. It's a fascinating tale and perhaps, and you're right, like we, we'd have to read it, we'd have to watch it to have an opinion on the movie. I just, for me, it was very interesting that it was getting such a mixed, you know, the the people who were in it and some of the people who watched it were like, wow, this is so powerful and it really moved me. And then other people were like, how dare you romanticize that period of time? And to me, it was just like, there's a lot going on here that seems like it's worth digging into. And, and and maybe what you're talking about is really a lot of it that that it it pokes something tender, and 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 we don't really like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about that. So, I don't know if I can recommend watching it. I think we're going to watch it, but I can definitely say read a little bit about it, and you know, give yourself a, a moment to think about your perspective on how your identity is influenced by external factors. Yeah. So my Bikerian moment is actually a little lighter, but still um, something that I'm sure people are actually feeling a little bit. And it's more about the politics of entertainment right now. Um, people may have noticed some of the big uh, Marvel shows on Netflix all got canceled. Seems to be that there's a battle going on there because Disney wants to start its own streaming service. And I'm certain that they would like to start bringing home a lot of those franchises that have been out. And I have to say that I think the most frustrating part about it is as a consumer of such things, it really just turns me off to, you know, have a show that I like canceled likely because Disney just wants to get it on their own streaming service. Um, I get that it's all money and politically based when it comes to this stuff, but realistically, all it does is kind of turn me off from wanting to watch Marvel shows on Netflix for a little while because <coughs> I'm caught up in their battle in some way. So um, there's not really a conclusion there, just mostly a voicing of frustration around that sort of thing. Well, and I would say take note. We've been relying on streaming services and we've ceased to purchase physical copies and they are not ours. If you really like something, now is the time to go down to the used store and get those DVDs of the things you like because there is no guarantee it's going to be available to you. Oh, yeah. No, I completely agree. I mean, it still kills me a little bit. I'm I'm a huge music buff, and I still buy CDs for things that I really want to have a physical copy of, but otherwise I just end up, you know, purchasing uh, actual copies, and I do. I purchase, um, you know, files from iTunes, which is so yesterday – when you've got access to everything live all the time on Spotify, but much like the point we made in talking to Tyler, um, it's, those are services. You don't own that and you're not guaranteed it. Um, and even if you're paying for it, if they cancel a contract with, um, one of their major record labels, they just pull down half of the albums that are on there. So I, I, as an art connoisseur, I don't like the idea of having things be so fleeting because I do like the idea of owning things and being able to watch them or listen to them when I want to. So it is kind of a strange world. It's We'll have to see um, how that stuff sort of plays out. Mm -hmm. And on that note, thanks for listening. If you have ideas, feedback, thoughts, please find us on social media. We are Bicurian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can give us a call at 720-507-7309. And you can always email us at podcast at com. And if you like what we're doing, please tell your friends about us or share the episodes that you find most interesting. Thank you. <laughs>